like sun. And this has been a three-part series. And um, next Sunday morning, Oliver Senna. Uh, Senna. <laughs> Oliver Senna. I don't know why, Pastor Mo. I struggle saying Oliver's name. Were you here the day, you guys, that I got it wrong and I called him Oliver Sinner? <laughs> In front of everybody. And there's no going back from that. Now I've named him Oliver Cinema. Okay. And it's such an easy name. I don't get it, but Oliver Senna is going to be preaching next Sunday morning, and I hope you will you will be here for that very special message. Um, I just might mention too, pray for their family. Um, they've experienced so much death over the last six to seven years, and uh, just yesterday Oliver let me know that his um, his daughter-in-law, Alicia, she. Um, she, she, it's on her side of the family, but their little five-year-old who already had some serious health issues um, died related to the pandemic. And so um, just be praying for, for that family. But uh, today is Pentecost Sunday. Amen. This, is, um, this is a day that um, the Holy Spirit was just poured out in the upper room. And the kind of church that we are, you guys, we're a Pentecostal church. Um, that means that we practice the New Testament gifts of the Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, it basically just means this. We try to do church like they did it originally. That's basically what it means. And we're extremely uh, passionate about that. Um, I'm going to be mentioning that in the end of the message and, and tying it in. But in this series, Like Father, Like Son, we've been exploring the beauty of family embedded in a 150 year time period that happened about a thousand years before the birth of Christ. And um, it was just before and during and after the reign of King David, this 150 years. It was during this time that the phrase, the phrases happened that I started the series with, my God, my God, my head, my head, my father, my father, my son, my son. It is the interface of God with humanity. Keep that picture in mind of where I-10 crosses Loop 303, all of the different lanes merging together. When God merges with humanity, it's complicated. It's, um, it takes exquisite work on His part. But it's beautiful. It, the traffic keeps flowing. He welcomes us into the kingdom. Amen. So, week one was the head. The head's connected. The head bone's connected to every other part of the body. And then last week, week two, was the torso, the six-pack of abs. That was probably the strangest sermon title I've ever had. <laughs> right up there with when I wanted to preach on women's National Women's Ministry Day, I wanted the sermon to be titled Wordly Women, meaning women of the word. But the secretary got it wrong and she typed in worldly women. That took a lot of explanation. <laughs> but today, for week three, the feet all the way down to the very bottom of the body of Christ, and in particular, the heel. The message today is called the Achilles heel. Achilles is the mythical warrior from Greek folklore who was supposedly invincible and strong, and the story goes that his mother dipped him in the river uh, to holding him by his heel and dipped him in the river sticks and and while she's dipping him she has to hold on to something so she holds on to his heel every part that got covered supposedly was invincible he's an invincible warrior but since he couldn't have the heel covered that was his one weak spot and so the the warrior their their mythical god was killed by a spear that struck him in the heel and that's where the phrase Achilles' heel comes from. That's why his, his heel was supposedly so vulnerable. The Achilles' heel injury is one of the most feared among athletes. Um, it took out Kobe, one of my basketball heroes, Kobe Bryant. Now, he recovered from it. I, he was off for seven months. But um, after recovering from the surgery, he tried to come back and 
he just never was quite the same after that. He just, the old Achilles heel really did him in. I mean, he had broken bones, broken ribs, every finger on his hand dislocated, all of that stuff. But the Achilles heel, it is the most feared injury among basketball players. The most recent one that we're all watching is Kevin Durant. Um, he missed the entire season this season because in the championship last year, Again, he tore his Achilles heel, so he had surgery. And um, as it turns out, with with the uh, pandemic happening, it actually turned out pretty good for him. No better time to have surgery and take a season off, right, than when they're not even having basketball. But um, we're all waiting to to see if he'll really be able to come back from this. Um, so um, the Hebrew word last week that I used for you is the word Abi and uh, it means my father and and that's why we were talking about the abs remember that the, it was five I'm sorry six different individuals whose names they were named after Abi so it was Abigail and Abi Shalom Absalom and and um, Abiathar and all, all of them. My father is light. My father is lamp. My father, and so it was all about my father, my father, my father. Um, same thing this week. Ahi is the Hebrew word for my brother. Ahi, Achilles. You see what I did there? Achilles. <laughs> And, and there's lots of them in Scripture. There's lots and lots of these people named my brother. And um, in fact, there's over 30 of them. Um, here's a few of them in the Bible that you probably have heard of. Ahab, Ahiam, Ahihud, Ahijah, the prophet Ahijah, Ahikam, Ahimaez, Ahinadab, Ahiram, Last week we talked about Ahithophel. He's named for my brother. Ahitub. One a very interesting one that you should recognize from last week is Huram Abi, because he falls in both categories. Huram Abi is, um, it means my father is light. But depending on how you take that root word and translate it, it can also mean my brother, the lofty one. So he has both the abs and the Achilles covered in his one name. But the one that I want to focus on this morning, in just one name, it's a guy named Ahimelech. Ahimelech. My brother is the king. Um, get this. Ahimelech, his name is my brother is king. His brother wasn't king, by the way. But he was like a brother with David, who was the king. And I thought, this is just so funny. I'm not sure what to make of this, but Ahimelech had a son, and he named him Abiathar. And Abiathar means, get this, my father is great. Ahimelech named his son, my father is great. Hey, what's your name? My father is great. No, 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 what's, what's your name? <laughs> My dad is number one. <laughs> he, I mean, who names their son? My father is great. I mean, you got to have a lot of confidence. It's like the guy that's wearing the shirt, number one granddad in the world, right? But but if your grandkids give it to you, it's a fact, right? So you just you wear it with pride. Um, now maybe, perhaps, we are to think of it as the father is great. Maybe he was naming his son, my Lord, my God is great. So we're going to give him the benefit of a doubt. But anyway, um, Ahimelech was, was a priest. He was much older than David. He was nearing the end of his, his priestly responsibilities. And let's read the story. It's 1 Samuel chapter 21. You can follow along if, if you would like to. And it's about David at Nob. And so let me just set it up for you because the setting has, has everything to do with this, with this uh, scripture we're about to read. David was running for his life. What had just happened was King Saul tried to take him out. 
King Saul has thrown a spear at his own son Jonathan because he's so mad about David. David didn't show up for the feast two days in a row. And Saul, who was extremely paranoid, thought that David's trying to steal my throne and he wanted to take him out. And so they just had the famous incident. Remember this one? David said to Jonathan, who was like a brother to him, they were such great friends, he says, your father's out to get me. And, and Jonathan, says, Jonathan says, no, 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 you, you don't have to worry. He would hide nothing from me. If he was trying to take you out, David, I would know. But they agreed to have this sign. I'll fill him out over the next few days of the feast, and I'll watch and see. And David says, when you find out, come to the field. And Jonathan says, here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll shoot the spear way out there. And I will tell my helper, if, if, he's, if, my, if you're okay and my dad's not out to get you, I'll just say, hey, here it is right in front of you. Go ahead and pick it up and bring it back. But if I yell to him, aren't the arrows beyond you? That's the signal. That's exactly what happened. They embrace, he weeps, and he leaves running for his life. After this story, he's going to end up in a cave in Adullam, hiding out from the king with 400 rebels. 400 people that were distressed. They felt marginalized. Chapter 22 says they were in debt. They were deeply distressed. They felt isolated from society. They were people that were not really connected. They were poor. They were needy. That's who David built his army with. That, that's who, no other king did this. Every other king, they're trying to get the best of the best. But David says, are you weak? Are you uh, in, in distress? Are you in debt? Are you feeling isolated? Are you feeling marginalized? There's a place for you in my kingdom. Who does that sound like? That? I'll tell you who it sounds like. It sounds like Jesus. I'm so glad that Jesus let me in. I was so marginalized. I was so away from Him. So let's read this story then. It's verses 1 through 9. David went to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech trembled. Why? Why is he trembling? Well, because, because David is the bad guy and he's on the run. It's, some people, some Bible scholars believe that actually this entire discussion that we're about to read between Ahimelech the priest and David the this future king was all staged because there's one guy eavesdropping. And actually there's a lot of biblical support. When you do the exegesis of scripture it really makes sense. Maybe David and the priest planned this whole thing. Or maybe it's just what it is. But, but he's trembling when he met him and he asked why are you alone? Why is no one with you? Verse 2, David answered Ahimelech the priest, The king sent me on a mission and said to me, No one is to know anything about the mission I'm sending you on. As for men, my men, I've told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here. Provided that the men have kept themselves from women. What he's saying, what the priest is saying, provided that they are ceremonially clean. He's trying to think of, is there anything that would keep them from being ceremonially clean? And that's the one thing that would be, would be a hindering block. And David, verse 5, he replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us. Translation, we, we haven't had pleasure, any pleasures. We're traveling, we're warriors. And as usual, whenever I set out, and the men's bodies are holy on missions that are not holy. That's such a strange sentence. The, the men's bodies are holy 
on missions that are not holy. Do you ever feel like you're on a mission and you're holy, but everything around you is not holy? Let me tell you, this boy, this is a challenging time to be a Christian in America. It's one of the most important times to be a Christian in America right now. So, um, so he's, he says to him, um, the men's bodies are holy even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence. Think of the symbolism of this. The bread of the presence he gives to King David. David is weary. He's worn out. He's exhausted. He doesn't have answers. He doesn't know what to do. He's trying to do the best he can with his ragtag group of people. And, and he eats the bread of the presence. What was the bread of the presence? It had been put in the holy place and it stayed there for seven days and on the rotation system once the new hot bread came out of the oven and it was put into the presence of God, then they took the old bread out and it became common bread. That meant that the priest could eat it. They, they could distribute it. And, and uh, David actually did have a right to that bread as, as a king. He, it was clearly within the confines of something that, that he could do. But can you just imagine how powerful that is? This is the bread that was the bread of the priest. It's not just any bread. You know, he didn't just go down to the day-old uh, bread store and grab something that was being discarded. This was the bread of the presence that had been devoted to God. God provided for him. And, and so you and I, men, we can take that. Uh, it, it's so, so special. The bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Verse 7. Now, one of Saul's servants was there that day. Aha! Uh -huh. Here's the guy that's eavesdropping. Here's the guy that the whole conversation might be staged for. One of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. David asked him, Elek, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon uh, because the king's mission was so urgent. Maybe it is staged. Maybe, maybe perhaps this whole conversation is staged. And he, but he's saying, I need a sword, and the only reason I don't have one is because the king sent me out lickety split. No, the truth is he escaped with his wife helping him sneak out the back window for his life. And and he doesn't have a sword. And so the priest replied in verse number nine. The sword of Goliath, isn't this interesting? The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley, is here. It is wrapped in cloth. And, um, and so can you just picture that? This, this sword that's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, you can have it. So the ephod was, again, a holy item. The ephod was the garment that the priest would wear. They have taken the sword, Goliath's sword, the same sword that years earlier David had taken from Goliath and cut off his head. That sword apparently has become like a holy relic. And they wrap it up in the ephod. And, and he says, well, I've got this thing. And, and David's response is classic. There is none like it. Give it to me. Which is really interesting because... He's headed into Philistine territory. He's going to Gath immediately after this. Why would he carry Goliath's sword and pretend to be a Philistine warrior, which is what he did? So it, it does, there's some things about this that make you think, boy, this was, this was um, planned in a, a different kind of a way. I meant to take this sermon today in a different direction. Um, I planned series out and I had planned to draw on some comparisons about brotherly love as we conclude this series about family but Monday changed everything for me and changed things for our nation um, the death of George Floyd was senseless 
and there is absolutely no justifiable reason for it to have happened at all. I'm heartbroken when I see the video. There is no justification for what happened to him. Law enforcement, I love, and my family loves. We always have. We have uh, in our family a great heritage of people who have served in law enforcement. And I know, I think as well as anyone, what is required, the expectations of, of officers, so unfair to, to have to know in a split second what right or wrong is, to discern um, things in a, matter, in a moment, to have to decide in an instant, do I draw or do I refrain? That's not, not fair. And I, um, my family, of course, has been hit in a personal way with our son being arrested in our driveway. It was brutal. I, I understand that it needed to be. It had to be. But it was unfortunate, some of the things that happened that night that were very, very painful. And I want you to know that after that, Stephanie and I intentionally have honored law enforcement and always will. It was a short while after that that we had on a Sunday morning, Law Enforcement Sunday here at Buckeye First Assembly. We recognized law enforcement and presented them with uh, wristbands that are braided with black cord and have a thin blue line going through them. I love and honor law enforcement, and I always will. Um, last week I told you that Avi is not only about the nuclear family, my father is not only about the, the nuclear family in the, in the house, but Avi was sort of a title that meant more like um, um, village chief. Uh, he, he would say things and speak things and, and it was respected. Well, the same is true of Ahi. A brother is so much more than just a biological brother. It's a decision to walk in love. That's what, when the Bible names people Ahi Melech or Ahi whatever, my brother, it is an intentional step towards love. That's, that's the love brotherhood in the Bible. And so it's so much more than, than a biological brother. In other words, you and I, we can choose to be brothers. We can choose to be brother and sister. We can choose to be family. Our family consists of more than the people that we were born by or the people that we give birth to. Our family has become intricately knit together with people who love God. We are the family of God. And more than that, we love humanity. And if you don't love humanity, then you're not a Christian. Go back to square one. So we must love one another. So I'm going to make two observations that really are in light of uh, uh, the last week, and, and I promise to be an equal offender this morning. I promise to offend everyone equally. I, if I've already offended you, great. If I haven't yet, I promise I will. Well, these are not necessarily gospel, but these are this is from my life experience. This is where I've landed at. And I think at the conclusion you'll see just a heart for, for the Lord and a heart for humanity. First observation. Peaceful protesting is permissible, but rioting is wrong, criminal, and fear-based. I did not see the news this morning. I don't know what has happened even after I stopped watching at a point last night, but things have been nuts in our nation. I mean, absolute nuts. Um, the, the video that is so touching to me is of black store owners yelling to people in the streets, why are you doing this? I worked my whole life for this business. Don't do this. I know that our Constitution protects the right to protest. And actually, you and I are part of a protest. We're called Protestants. That means we're protestants. I don't know if you know that. In the 1500s, 
This church was one of hundreds, no, thousands of branches of the church that stem back to protests in the 1500s. And sometimes protests are necessary and they are permissible. I never join in with them because here's what I know. I know where it's always going to head. And there's always that element of people that are bent on fury and want nothing but rioting. And rioting is wrong, it's criminal, and it's fear-based. I cannot tell you how much hatred is in my heart for mob mentality. We've got to be better than that. That's not what America is about. When people gather and assemble under some kind of pretense, but there's really no purpose to it. Because um, it's not even about George Floyd at this point or other victims. It is about hatred and just uh, people have been uh, cooped up and, and they're, they're just stir crazy from, from what's been expected of us as a nation the last 12 weeks. And so, and so we just, people just, they go nuts. And it's not just in Minneapolis and it's not just in Atlanta, it's here in our valley. Last night in Scottsdale, I watched on the, in Scottsdale of all places, a man bloodied because someone, he, someone took after him with some type of object and windows broken out, broken out of buildings in Scottsdale, please. And of course, downtown Phoenix, the last three nights in a row, it's just, it's just been awful. <coughs> So, the officers involved with this horrible crime are facing retribution. And I'm calling on Christians everywhere to let it run its course. And I think as Christians, as a church, that needs to be our approach. That let's honor law enforcement the best we can. This was horrible what happened. It is being dealt with. Here's the second observation. Racism is hatred, pure and simple. And it is a problem in our nation. Hatred is our Achilles heel. Racism is not the only problem in our nation. It's one of some, but it's a biggie. And let me just give you a little background of, of my life experience and what I've experience and, and it does kind of taint my view. When I was going into my sophomore year in high school, um, it was in between freshman and sophomore year, June 19th, 1981, our dad pastored in Mahia, Texas. And I remember I had just gotten a driver's license. I didn't buy my Camaro yet. I used to be such a bad dude. I had a 76 four barrel carburetor in that Camaro, 76 Camaro, man. It would, it would haul, it would fly, and it was fun, and it was fast, and, and it got me in trouble. And the truth is, I admitted to my mom after 30 years down the road that the night that I got a, a speeding ticket for 72 miles per hour in a 55, and she couldn't believe it, Keith, what were you thinking? And then I, 30 years later, had the courage to admit to her that I was slowing down. And that I was riding with three youth group members and they were pushing me, see if it'll do 100. I chickened out at 96. And I was slowing down coming over the hill and got pulled over at 92 miles per hour. But before that, that was my beast car. Before that, my sophomore year, I drove a gremlin. <laughs> white with an orange stripe. It was the family car and dad provided it and he said you're welcome to drive it and I'll give you seven dollars for gas each week. If you want to go out extra you find a way to pay for it yourself. But that year June 19th 1981 we had a horrible tragedy in our town um, out at Lake Mahea um, for the Juneteenth celebration. There was a party out on the island and three young black men Two of them were 18, one was 19. Were uh, apprehended because they were found to have marijuana. They, they were doing wrong. They were participating in wrong, illegal activity. They got arrested by three officers. Two of them were white and one was black. Um, the, black the three black young men were handcuffed, put in a boat, 
And when they started out across the lake to get back to the shore, it became just immediately apparent there was way too much weight in the boat. There were six adults and the boat capsized. Three black young men died. They drowned. The two white officers swam to shore. The one, the one white, uh, the one black officer, couldn't swim, but he was rescued. While the other three handcuffed young men sank to the bottom of the lake. Boy, I, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't plan to be emotional about this, but. Even now I remember how our, our city changed overnight and vultures came into our city for two weeks. It was on the news every night and, and uh, it was horrible. But I only know how deeply it impacted my best friends because I played on the basketball team. My best friends were black. A lot of pain, a lot of hurts. See, um, at my at my house growing up, um, I remember Andy's friend. Uh, was his name Jimmy? Am I right? Do you remember way back? Would sit at our table. He was just family. He's just a, a dear friend. Um, my in-laws ministered to the Hispanic people of Central America for 20 years. And then when they came back to the States here, um, I've told you this before, Jerry loves the Spanish language. He said this, you know, that's what they're going to speak in heaven. He would even dream in Spanish. And so they ministered to Spanish-speaking people here. My mother-in-law, one of her dear tennis friends, is a Korean lady. Um, my, my own family, both of our boys, their best friends were black. It's just, it just happened that way. But uh, Zach, his, his best friend, um, was, was a black young man. And, um, and Kyrie is, is like family still to this day. Man, they had so much fun together. Nick had two friends, both are black. Um, Jovan and Asante. Um, Jovan was so close to our family that one morning I walked out of the living room and Jovan sitting at my kitchen table and I said, Jovan, what are you doing here? And he looked at me and said, eating cereal? <laughs> <laughs> I remember him going over to a, a dresser drawer in our living room and he's digging through and rummaging through. I said, what do you, what do you need there? Can I help you? Oh, no, I'm just looking for a paintbrush. I don't mean, if it was that close. We're that kind of friends. And then Asante was Nick's best man. So I love all people, all races. There is one race. There is one human race, and it comes in a lot of different varieties. Um, I, I don't know what to make of everything that's happening right now, but I'm praying for the Navajo Nation. I, I have so much pain in my heart for what they're experiencing. I think a lot of it, um, having talked with Philbert and then another friend who's very involved with ministry uh, on the Navajo Nation, a lot of it stems from not having uh, running water and, and uh, by people living it together, large families in small homes and and just, um, it's been brutal. It has been brutal to them. And among our black Pentecostal churches, one of my uh, favorite organizations is our sister organization. Uh, the Assemblies of God has always been just side by side with Church of God in Christ. And uh, God has done beautiful things through that relationship through the years. But um, they have been hit really hard, and I do not know why. I don't know if there's things genetically, I don't know how it all works, but there have been 17 bishops die from COVID. And you know, um, here's the thing, we spend so much time in today's world saying we're all the same. We're all the same. There's no differentiation. Uh, we're, you know, we're the same sex. 
But if you're a man, if you want to be a lady, you can be a lady. We're all the same. And, and we're so much the same that we never want to even mention the difference in the color of our skin. But I'm amazed by how beautiful God is in His creation. God just simply, when He made man, He just scooped down and grabbed dirt and breathed breath of life into it. And when I go around this earth, I see all different colors of sand. There's white, there's black, there's red, there's yellow, there's all these different... And it, to me, it just seems like God, the God of variety, created differences that are beautiful if we will embrace them. Um... I think that, you know, we tend to think of biblical characters as if they're just like us. For instance, if, if I'm white, then King David, he was white. And this man we're reading about, uh, Ahimelech, he was white. And, and of course, Jesus was white. You know, with long flowing blonde hair and blue eyes and a British accent. And I know that because I've seen every movie and that's always how he is. But I think we might be surprised when we get to heaven. What does Jesus look like? You know, King David was a ruddy, dark, complected, Middle Eastern Jewish man. Jesus most likely was dark skinned with a strong Middle Eastern flair to his facial features with black dense hair. In other words, we might be different on the outside in the variety of the way God makes us appear, but on the inside we are all the same. We all have blood flowing through our bodies. We all have a need for our Lord and Savior. We all are sinners and we need grace. And so, in closing, here's the takeaway. Here's the takeaway today. And it's a quote that's taken out of context, granted. But it's the book of Genesis when Cain killed Abel. And God came looking and he couldn't find Abel. And he said to Cain, where is your brother? And Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? It was really a rude thing for him to say. How arrogant am I, my brother's keeper? But in a positive way, I want you to just ask yourself, am I my brother's keeper? Maybe that's way, way too much responsibility because we can't be responsible for all of our brothers. But our heart should be that when our brother hurts, we want to help and we want to be their keeper. I heard Kobe Bryant say about Michael Jordan that uh, one time during the first All-Star game when I was 19 years old and I was at that time the youngest player in the NBA and I made it to the All-Star game and uh, they all in those days treated you with disrespect because who, who is this kid trying to make it here in the NBA? We're all you know older and stronger and bigger and wiser. And he said, I'm sitting next to Michael Jordan and I said to him, hey Mike, when you caught the ball down low on the block, you did a pivot, but how did you, you did it different? Do you mind if I ask, how did you do that? I didn't know how he would respond, but Michael Jordan looked at me and said, sure, man, here's what you, no, Kobe, here's all I did. And he took him step by step with a detailed answer exactly why he did that and what he would do the next time if it was handled differently by the defense. And then he says, not only that, Kobe said, not only that, but then he told me, hey, here's my phone number. If you ever have any questions, just call me. And so Kobe said, when people would say to me, do you think if you played one-on-one -on -one against Michael Jordan you could beat him? He said, I hate that question because Michael Jordan is like my brother. I love him like my brother. And he said, I don't even want to think of what would happen, but I just, I'm so glad that he poured into my life. Maybe Achilles was baptized in the river, the myth, but there's also another myth about that. There is the myth that his mother grabbed him by the heel and baptized him in fire. 
dropped him into the fire to burn all of the rough stuff away. Today, on Pentecost Sunday, we need to be baptized in the fire in a fresh, new way. And here's, here's something different. Typically, typically on Pentecost Sunday, man, we're going to call you to the front. We're going to anoint you with oil, pray over you for you to experience God's presence. And woohoo, people love that. You feel the warm fuzzies up and down your spine. It's amazing. But we can't do that right now. That's okay. Because our nation needs us to be Pentecostal in another way. The altar call today is to, is to love someone of a different color than you intentionally with an act of kindness this week. Praise God. We can't heal all of America, but we might be able to heal our little corner of the world by just continuing to show a climate of love, an act of kindness. Be the church. Let's be the church. Bow your heads with me and pray. Heavenly Father, like Pastor Mo mentioned earlier in the service, our nation needs You right now so much. Oh Father, People have a right to be upset. But they do not have a right to break the laws. They have a right to protest, but I'm, I'm just praying for a calm to settle over our nation. I ask with the Old Testament prophet Amos that justice would flow like a river in our nation. Lord, it's painful for us right now Many of us had hoped that things were much better, but now we're finding out there's a lot of animosity in our nation. We, though, we choose to be people of the Bible, people of faith in you, Christ Jesus. We choose to walk with you. We choose that we're going to be our brother's keeper. and We're going to share your love every place we can. So give us a fresh outpouring of Pentecost today, God. Give us a fresh outpouring of Your Holy Spirit. And Lord, fill us with so much compassion and so much love that it just spills over to everyone all around us. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, God bless you. Thanks for coming. I hope that you'll be here next Sunday at 10 a.m. unless we tell you differently, okay?